an oration of Dr. Zachary Ursene, exhorting to the study of Christianity pronounced by him in the Elizabeth School when he began his lectures upon Philip Melanchthon, his grounds of divinity, entitled Eramen Theologicum. Since, by advice of your regents and overseers in study, I have been wished to deliver unto you some short sum of Christianity, I must acknowledge my weakness far unable to support a burden of such weight, for this is a doctrine ever past understanding not only of the most wise and sharp-sighted of this world, unless instructed by the voice of the Church and power of the Holy Spirit, but, for a great part, unknown even to the angels themselves, until it pleased the Son of God to reveal it out of the deep wisdom of his eternal Father, which, if all the wits and tongues of men and angels should strain themselves to unfold and grace with curiosity of style and depth of invention, they could never be able to speak anything correspondent to the dignity and desert of so divine a subject. Being therefore, to myself guilty of mine own defects, I had rather leave this labour to some other who might more worthily attempt and more happily perform it than myself, but considering again the place and person I sustain, I have thought it my duty to do you all service in furthering your salvation, and to show obedience to God, inviting me to these religious labours, and promising, which is the chiefest thing, his gracious assistance, which whoso enjoineth need not despair of anything, for it pleaseth God to show his mighty power in weak and abject instruments, according to that of the psalmist, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength, because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Psalm 8 verse 3. The word which he useth signifieth a child which beginneth to speak and understand, but it is a thing usual to attribute the name of children, not unto those only which are so in years, but unto those also which are so in understanding, or doing aught besides. They also, which are infants in years, are sufficient witnesses of God's goodness and providence, the manifest tokens of God's presence, in miraculous propagation, preservation, and sustaining of mankind, do sufficiently repel and refute, here there is a lacuna in the text, and atheists of all sorts, both such as deny at all that there is any God, and such as do not acknowledge him to be such a God as he professeth himself to be. But Christ, in the twenty-first chapter of Matthew, verse sixteen, draweth this place to a confession, in which sense it agreeeth to us all, even as many as think or ought to speak of God, for we are infants in understanding and utterance of all heavenly things. We learn in this life some small rudiments of them, as truly and religiously saith the Emperor Gratian in his confession to Ambrose, we speak of God so much, not as we ought, but as we can. Yea, even the prophets and apostles confess as much of themselves, as 1 Corinthians 13 verse 9 we know imperfectly, and we prophesy imperfectly, but when that which is perfect shall come, then that which is unperfect shall be abolished. And in the twelfth verse, now we see through a glass darkly, but then shall we see face to face. But though both these rudiments which we learn be few, and the word of preaching be plain to our capacity, wherein God himself speaketh to us as unto infants, and suffereth us to speak like infants of himself, Yet will God so exact of us in this life skill in this doctrine of himself, that otherwise he giveth us no hope of another life, and these rudiments, how simple soever, do so far exceed all human wisdom, that betwixt the one and the other is no comparison. For these principles or grounds are a wisdom unknown to reason, necessary and sufficient to everlasting salvation. Let us, therefore, not only acknowledge our infancy, but also show ourselves willing to be reckoned in the number of sucklings and infants. For as the child groweth not, that is not sustained with the mother's milk, or other convenient nourishment, so neither must we refuse the milk of God's word, whereby we are nourished and sustained unto eternal life, lest we be put besides all hope of our perfection. This is that spiritual infancy, pleasing God as Christ witnesseth, when he rebuketh the Pharisees which were offended at the children singing in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. These are those infants in whose words it pleaseth him to be powerful, by whose mouth, as the psalm addeth, he perfecteth his strength, or, as they translate it, who consider the original, he establisheth his kingdom. But he speaketh of that strength or kingdom which is seen in this life, which is for the Son of God to appoint and uphold his ministry, to gather his dispersed church, to quicken the faithful believers by the preaching of the gospel, to sanctify them by the Holy Spirit unto eternal life, 
to protect his church in this life against the kingdom of Satan, after this life to raise up the faithful unto life eternal, that in them his deity may reign openly, not by ministry. What the foundation of this kingdom is, St. Paul teacheth, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11, other foundation can no man lay than that which is said, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation is Christ, first in his person, for that he beareth, keepeth, and comprehendeth all the members and parts of this kingdom, united and engrafted in him, as doth the foundation all other parts of the building, or as doth the vine all the branches, then to the doctrine of himself, that is, of his person and office. For as good laws are the strength and sinews of kingdoms politic, so the kingdom is composed, confirmed, and ordered by this doctrine delivered of Christ. And as the house cannot stand without the foundation, so, except we know who Christ is, and what he hath performed for our sakes, all religion besides is but vain, forged, none at all. This foundation is laid by the mouth of sucklings and babes which believe, and being, here there is a lacuna in the text, up by the Holy Ghost, do learn and embrace the doctrine which they hear, and so grow into Christ in whom they be engrafted. In this weighty work God vouchsafeth to use our infancy for an instrument, to the advancement of his glory, whilst the weightiness of the work and weakness of the instruments do plainly show that all this is done not by our strength, but by the power and might of the Almighty God, and also to abate the pride of his enemies, whilst their might and power is surpassed by our weakness, and our show of wisdom doth in the end show that nothing is more foolish than their wisdom, as it is said, Your strength shall be in silence and hope, for the Son of God destroyeth the works of the devil, delivering those that believe from his tyranny, pardoning and putting away their sins, beginning in them righteousness and life eternal, defending his church, accusing and discovering the malice of his enemies, repressing and punishing them both now and in the final delivery of his church from all evils. And all this, manger the gates of hell, he doth partly bring to pass and partly testify by the unworthy and simple mouths of men. As it is said, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to cast down bolds, casting down the imaginations, and every high thing that is exalted against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having ready the vengeance against all disobedience, when your obedience is fulfilled, as therefore the baseness of the vessel doth not prejudice the preciousness of the merchandise therein contained, so neither must you disdain the meanness and infancy of him that delivereth this doctrine unto you, as derogating aught from the weight of those reasons which shall be alleged to persuade you to the serious study of Christian religion. But purposing forthwith to recite some of them, I find myself so plunged in the depth thereof that I can hardly resolve where to begin. Yet because I must of necessity handle some of them, let that be the first which should be the rule of all our action and studies, namely the will of God revealed in his word. For we now confer together which are fellow citizens of the church, knowing for certain that the books of the prophets and apostles are sure interpreters of God's will and purpose. In them are precepts everywhere delivered and repeated, commanding without exception to search and know the doctrine therein contained. This is that precept of the Sabaoth delivered in the Ten Commandments. This is that whereof our Saviour said in the tenth of Luke, forty-second verse, that one thing was necessary. This is that wisdom whose knowledge he saith is eternal life. This David commendeth, as in many other places, so in this first psalm, where he layeth down, as it were, a brief thereof. But this our Heavenly Father, merciful to mankind, and careful for our salvation, thought not sufficient. He added, therefore, a peculiar charge of proposing a sum of this doctrine unto all, especially the younger sort. And this is that which we term catechizing, as Deuteronomy 4 verse 9, Thou shalt, saith he, teach thy sons, and Deuteronomy 6 and 11, Lay up these words in your hearts and in your minds, and hang them for a sign in your hands, and place your eyes thereon. Teach thy children to meditate in them, when thou sittest in thine house, and walkest in the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Thou shalt write them upon the posts and doors of thine house, that thy days and thy children's days may be multiplied in the land. Here we see parents and those who are instead of parents are commanded to teach, and provide that there be teaching, the younger sort to learn, both sorts daily to inculcate, repeat, and meditate upon this doctrine, 
Now, whereas he will that this doctrine should be delivered to our children, and always placed before our eyes, it is plain that he requireth brevity and perspicuity. That is a catechism, or short sum of Christianity, with an exposition neither tedious nor difficult. So Paul, 2 Timothy 1 verse 13, Keep the true pattern of wholesome words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Here, together with the definition of our catechism, we have the exercise and practice thereof commanded. This true pattern, whereof the apostle speaketh, doth signify true sentences of each part of this doctrine, briefly and orderly comprised, and, as it were, presented to our view, with a form of teaching and speaking that is proper, plain, and suitable to the writings of the prophets and apostles. Whereupon he nameth them wholesome words delivered by himself in faith, or concerning faith and love which is in Christ, that is, in the acknowledging of Christ, as everywhere he reduceth all piety and religion to faith and charity. The catechism, therefore, is a sum of the doctrine of faith and love in Christ delivered by the prophets and apostles, or a sum of Christianity briefly, orderly, and plainly comprised. For we must not devise a doctrine of our own, but of necessity refer ourselves, as it is said, Isaiah the 8th verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. But hereunto also must be added an exposition to unfold truly the parts and method, and to interpret plainly the words and phrase. This reason alone might be sufficient to stir up men, not profanely minded, to the study of this heavenly doctrine, for to such the will and commandment of God is sufficient, though there were no other reason besides. But, since it hath pleased our merciful God to yield unto our weakness some reasons why he hath given us this commandment, it behoveth us to consider of them with all reverence. Now God teacheth us that we must therefore learn this doctrine, because by knowledge thereof, and no other means, he purposeth to convert and save all those who through age are able to understand, and amongst them such as shall be heirs of eternal life. It is a confident and strange saying of St. Paul, Romans 1 verse 16, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, and 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved it is the power of God. And in the same chapter, the twenty-first verse, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. But this opinion, as it is delivered and confirmed by many and weighty testimonies of the Holy Spirit, so it is very forcibly impugned by the devil. For the father of lies, seeing that this paradox of the foolish preaching of the cross did not a little possess the minds of men, took occasion to incite brain-sick heads to say that this our teaching was in no wise a means to convert souls, but that God without means did impart and communicate himself to us, and that we did but make an idol of our own words, and here they pour out wonderful words, seeming in show very glorious. But hearken, I pray you, and consider upon what grounds they stand. God, say they, needeth not at all this voice of ours, either ministry, reading, or meditation, to convert men. Therefore he useth no such means, neither is the learning thereof necessary to salvation. Now therefore, I speak to you which are children, is there any amongst you of so shallow and childish conceit, which will not scorn him that shall reason in this sort? God, by his omnipotency, can easily bring to pass that a man without books or teachers or study may become learned, as the apostles and others in the primitive church did speak with tongues which they never learned. He can make the earth fruitful without labor of the husbandman. He can sustain man's nature without meat, as he did Moses and Christ forty days, and therefore... It is a labour unnecessary, not a means to compass what we wish and expect, either for scholars to busy themselves about books and study, and to go to their instructors and schools, or for husbandmen to manure their ground, or for any of us to spend our life in sustaining our life. Do you see upon what rocks of blindness and distraction the devil doth drive these unhappy men, who, never having learnt the grounds of godliness or good arts, nor loving the labour and toil of learning, would, notwithstanding, seem what they are not, desiring to extol themselves against the knowledge of God, not doubting to subject the eternal wisdom to their vile censures. For they show themselves as well witless as shameless in alleging examples either of such as by miracle were converted as Paul, or endued with gifts extraordinary as the apostles in the Pentecost, or of many hearing the gospel and not believing. Or, lastly, in, here there is a lacuna in the text, 
such places of Scripture as preach unto us the power and office of the Holy Ghost. We know, God be thanked, and confess that God can without help either of teachers or learners convert whom he will, and that the end and use of miracles is this, to show that the order of nature wherein he is powerful was by him before created, and is still by him most freely preserved. We know further that the converting of souls is the gift of God above, so that look how much greater and more miraculous a work it is to restore man being lost unto salvation than to create him out of nothing. So much more impudency and madness is it rather to attribute our redemption than our creation to the force and efficacy of man's words. This also we know that it pleased God by foolish preaching to save those that believe. Why it hath so pleased him, although he need not make us account, yet he is content to yield us some reasons ever of this his purpose, though he propose not the like reasons to the godly and ungodly. To the ungodly he yieldeth this reason, because his justice in condemning their malice, which resist the word revealed, should be more manifest in the sight of the whole church, their consciences also bearing witness. But we may also consider other causes which make for our instruction and comfort. Whereas the voice of the ministry and all our conceit of God is veiled with darkness, wherein we now behold God and know his pleasure, hence he admonisheth us of the greatness of our fall, whereby it is come to pass that now we enjoy not the presence of God, dealing with us, as it were, afar off, and by interpreters, stirring us up to aspire unto that heavenly school wherein God will be seen of us face to face, and shall be all in all. Besides, God in this life will have the searching, meditation, and confession of this doctrine touching himself and his will, not to be concealed in the minds of men, but to be openly sounded and celebrated, and therefore, on his authority, he hath bound us to a necessity of knowing it, promising thereby to restore us to salvation. Furthermore, being willing to have us fellow labourers in the most excellent of his divine works, wherein could he better show his love to us miserable creatures, except in giving his only begotten Son a ransom for our sins? We therefore affirm the reading, hearing, and knowing of this doctrine to be a necessary instrument of our salvation, not in respect of God, but in respect of ourselves, not because God could not otherwise have converted us, as the builder cannot build an house without his tools, but because he would not otherwise do it. True faith is indeed the gift and work of none but God only, yet so that it is wrought in us by the Holy Ghost through the hearing of God's word. Paul planteth, Apollos watereth, but God giveth increase. And when Paul termeth the gospel preached by him, the power of God unto salvation, to as many as believe, and Ephesians 4 verse 11, he gave some to be apostles and prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the gathering together of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ. Can any more glorious word be spoken concerning the office of teaching? Let us not, therefore, presume to be wiser than God. Let us not forsake things ordinary to follow things extraordinary. Neither let us so much esteem the pride and reprobate contumacy of such as contemn the voice of the gospel, that we less regard and reverence the force and fruit of God's ordinance in his instruments of mercy, as neither the sloth and perverse peevishness of some scholars, being barriers to profit and all good proceedings, can persuade others that instruction and study are things unnecessary to the attaining and increase of learning and virtue, but let us rather, with all submission and thankfulness, embrace this sweetest comfort, whereby we are assured that our labours please God, and are not undertaken by us in vain, according to those sayings, Ecclesiastes 11 verse 1, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for after long time thou shalt find it again. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58, Your labour is not in vain in the Lord. Matthew 18 verse 20, Wheresoever two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them. Were not these promises well known unto us, and certain in themselves, in this so great fury of Satan and misery of mankind, our best teachers and most careful furtherers of the public salvation were in condition most unhappy and could not maintain this place without great difficulty. I truly, for mine own part, knowing myself to be of no reckoning, feel myself so surprised with sorrow, that for grief I should neither be able to abide this place, nor give passage to my speech. Did not I certainly know that even in this company there are some whose hearts receive and approve true and wholesome doctrine? and are by the Holy Spirit inflamed with desire of acknowledging and worshipping God aright, and are living temples of God, such as shall hereafter glorify him with the angels in heaven. Neither do I so speak this, 
as if I did expect that all men should have like knowledge of this doctrine, and equal gifts of the Holy Ghost without difference. For St. Paul willeth us, in the twelfth to the Romans, to be wise according to that measure of faith which God hath given to every man. But it is necessary that all which look to be saved should hold the same foundation, that is, they must know and believe what Christ is and what he hath performed for every of us, as it is said by John, the seventeenth chapter and third verse, This is life everlasting, to know that thou art the only true God, and whom thou hast sent, Jesus Christ. John 3, verse 36, He that believeth in the Son hath eternal life. By these and other such like sentences we understand that it is a true saying which Dionysius, falsely surnamed Areopagite, but indeed supposed to be of Corinth, doth attribute to the Apostle, St. Bartholomew, the gospel is short and long. The shortness thereof is manifest, excelling therein the law of Moses, and this ought and may be rooted in every of our hearts and minds, which is the reason why a brief of the gospel is so often delivered and repeated by the prophets and apostles. But the wisdom of the gospel will far more hardly be sounded and searched through all eternity than that of the law. But knowing for certainty that we must in this mortality begin our eternal life, for we shall be clothed upon our clothing, if we be not found naked. The nature of true conversion is never to suffer those which are converted unto God to rest in their race, but kindleth in them a perpetual desire of proceeding. Therefore is that commandment given in the second of Peter, chapter 3, verse 18, increase in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, and Ephesians 2, verse 19, now therefore ye are no more strangers but citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, coupled together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. And Mark 9 verse 24, he prayeth, Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. And Luke 17 verse 5, his disciples pray, Lord, increase our faith. The godly are said and commanded to go forward, and do also pray themselves that they may go forward. They are not, therefore, of that sort of men which have no desire to go forward, yet must not such be discouraged, who, finding in themselves less light and vigour, do with true grief of heart acknowledge and bewail their weakness and corruption. For thus saith the Eternal Father of his Son, Isaiah 42, verse 3, A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. And the Son of his Father, Matthew 18, verse 14, It is not my Father's will that any one of these little ones should perish, and himself of himself, John 6, verse 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I cast not away. Wheresoever is unfeigned godliness, that cometh from God, and is by him furthered, and thereunto are linked by the indissoluble band of God's truth all the blessings of the gospel which are eternal and without repentance, for did not the certainty of our faith and salvation depend upon the free mercy of God alone, whereby he receiveth into favour all such as believe, and not upon degrees of our renewing and amendment? Our comfort, God knows, were built but on a weak foundation. Hence may be gathered three trials of a Christian man, first the embracing of this foundation, secondly a desire of going forward, which too include every of us under the universal promise of eternal salvation, thirdly this comfort, that for difference or inequality of gifts and degrees we shall not be cast off and suffered to perish, which comfort must be opposed to the grief conceived upon our own unworthiness. These, here there is a lacuna in the text, can never be separated, hath St. Paul's comprised in 1 Corinthians 3rd chapter, 11th verse, saying, Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, that is, Jesus Christ, and if any man build on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, timber, hay, or stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, but he shall be safe himself, nevertheless yet, as it were by the fire. By this therefore which hath hitherto been spoken, it is manifest that God's commandment, and every man's particular salvation, exhorteth and bindeth all men, and amongst them the younger sort, which are a great part and seminary of the church, to learn, as long as their years will permit, this foundation of Christian doctrine, which most gravely and severely admonisheth all such of this part of their duty who take upon them the charge of instructing youth. For both teachers and learners are all debtors of diligent and serious care in preserving piety and religion, debtors not unto ourselves only, but unto as many as are ours and belong any way to us, yea, and to all succeeding posterity, 
for we see by daily experience how easily in small process of time manifold defacings and corruptions and at length final and utter abolishment overtaketh that religion and doctrine the sum whereof is not briefly and perspicuously set down known in public daily repeated and beaten as it were into men's understandings neither are we ignorant of the common proverb how the cask or barrel retaineth still the savour and smell which it first received be it good or ill whereas then for the most part the evil we learn taketh such deep root in us and cleaveth so fast unto us and youth not being daily instructed and trained up unto piety threateneth a barbarous contempt of god and profaning of religion to ensue in time to come again whereas scarcely by the greatest endeavour and continual care of governors we are one to any good no man of discretion and judgment but will grant that it is wisdom and our duty to attempt betimes so weighty and difficult a matter the institution therefore of catechism is not only necessary for preserving pure and sincere doctrine with us and our posterity after us but in regard of youth to whom as hath already been proved it is to be imparted because it is framed fit for their capacity for if it be well said of other arts wherein this age is to be informed in all thy precepts use such brevity that intelligent wits may some conceive and faithfully preserve them in memory how much more is shortness and plainness to be effected and practised in this heavenly wisdom so strange unto man's understanding especially whereas the testimonies of holy scripture ratify and confirm our experience herein saying every one that useth milk is inexpert in the word of righteousness he is a babe but strong meat belongeth to them that are of age therefore both the apostle paul thus intimateth and signifieth unto us his manner of teaching i gave you milk to drink and not meat for ye were not able to bear it neither yet now are ye able for ye are yet carnal and since the first preaching of the gospel in the church some notable argument or subject of doctrine short and pithy plain and easy hath been extant and derived unto posterity insomuch as certain compendious sums delivered by god's own mouth seem to be of equal growth and continuance with mankind both of the law as if thou continue righteous thou shalt be accepted and also of the gospel as the seed of the woman shall break the head of the serpent so not long after the promise and the covenant was repeated unto abraham finally in process of time certain brief articles were published abroad in the apostles writings the form and manner of confession of christ and christian religion being proportionably applied to that which god had revealed in every age further than this our custom of teaching which we call catechism was practised both in the primitive church and in the apostles days paul witnesseth romans two verse eighteen where he termeth the jews instructed in the law from the childhood and galatians six verse six where he saith let them that is taught in the word make him that hath taught him partaker of all his goods luke also in his first chapter verse four that thou mightest acknowledge the certainty of those things whereof thou hast been instructed for as much then as these testimonies are such as deserve to be preferred before all others whereas the authors of them immediately followed the apostles times i therefore instance in no one example supposing it to be generally known out of the common histories i rather add this that if the primitive church being yet in her infancy did with so great constancy observe and retain this custom and form of instruction established as we see not by the counsel and advice of men but the deep wisdom and providence of god how much more ought we in this doting age of the world in which the church is ready to give up the ghost and the light thereof being extinguished loathsome darkness more and more ready to overshadow the whole world how much more ought we i say add unto the small measure of our diligence in maintaining and advancing the doctrine of the church rather than detract any the smallest portion thereof for this is that age which is spoken of matthew twenty four verse twenty three then if any shall say unto you lo here is christ or there believe it not for there shall arise false christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders so that if it were possible they should deceive the very elect and paul at large discourseth one timothy four and two timothy three and peter also in his second epistle second and third chapters of the iniquity and danger of these last troublesome times by the illusions of the devil wrought by the hands of those false prophets his suposts and proctors 
Now these predictions of the miseries which are to befall these later days are written and revealed unto us, not only for our collation and confirmation of the truth and faith of Christ, but to be a spur unto us, that we continue, here there is a lacuna in the text, and careful to provide such weapon and furniture as is requisite to the beating down and raising to the ground the bulwarks of all errors. For thus beginneth Christ this doleful prophecy, Take heed that no man deceive you. Let us therefore think it necessary, not only for them to whom he is or hereafter may be committed the charge of preaching and teaching in the church, but for every particular man also which desireth to be saved, to have a true concert and opinion of every point of Christian religion grounded and deep-rooted in his heart, to be fenced and fortified as strongly, as by all means he may, against sects and heresies, and that they who have received commission of governing and teaching in the church ought with great pain and travail either themselves teach and instruct, or take care that they who are committed to their cure and charge be taught and instructed in all these, unless they had rather, as unfaith, full and careless stewards, and dispensers of the word, give an account of the destruction of their flock, wherein the entire good affection of your parents is worthy high commendation, in that they have taken a special order for your daily instruction in the principles of religion, not at home only in their private houses and churches, but abroad also in public and free schools. For they will perceive what ignorance then ensued, and how wide a gate was then set open unto the devil, to entrap all men in these grounds of doctrine, when first the custom of the primitive church in teaching, and requiring again the points of catechism, at the hands of the catechumeni, began to be slackened, and in the end finally decayed, and in place thereof the vain and childish spectacle of popish confirmation succeeded. They will foresee that, as great mischances or greater than these are like to betide us, unless God in mercy look on us, and in time visit us, than which danger, as nothing can fall out more dreadful and lamentable to the godly, so the godly and religious can invent no greater joy and comfort unto themselves than to be able assuredly to promise unto themselves that their children and children's children shall long time after their decease enjoy that blessed light of the truth which shineth among us. Wherefore, if we be not utterly bereft of all human affections, and wax not cruel against those who love us rather than themselves, let us endeavour by all means not to frustrate, through our recklessness, this their good hope conceived, and annihilate their earnest, hearty desires, but let us together with them present ourselves thankful unto God, who, purposing to gather unto himself out of this scum of the world an everlasting church, by causing the sun of this gospel to retire back and shine in our hearts, hath so chased away the clouds and darkness of the kingdom of Antichrist, that no man, unless wilfully shutting his eyes and stopping his ears, he resists God's truth disclosed unto him, cannot but perceive and clearly see the devil unmasked of those bazaars of deceit and error wherein he vaunted himself and blinded the world, which, if we shall perform, Christ the Son of God shall continue unto us all his benefits in former times, and heap daily new blessings on us, according to his promise, to him which hath, that is, to him which hath a desire of proceeding, it shall be given. But if we do otherwise, the pains which are threatened in the contrary doom shall overtake us, from him which hath not, shall be taken away even that he hath. The scriptures themselves and the histories of all times cry and thunder out in our ears God's jealousy in not being able to endure the contempt of his gospel revealed. Isaiah complaineth, They have cast off the law of the Lord of hosts, and contemned the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore is the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched out his hand upon them, and hath smitten them. And Amos threateneth, Behold, the dates come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even unto the east, shall they run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Behold, we see the Israelitish nation, which God had enriched with so honourable titles and privileges, and made famous and glorious over all the kingdoms of the earth, for the many strange events and wonderful miracles showed amongst them. Behold, we set this... Here there is a lacuna in the text. Nation, now grown base and contemptible, trodden under foot of the very outcasts of the earth, and in the very midday and noon light of their prophecies, so bestially and blockishly blind, that the consideration of this their example is able to move and stir up evil men, I say not unto laughter or indignation, 
but rather to stick into their hearts a dreadful horror of the like judgment. Now that the contempt and neglect of sound doctrine touching God and our salvation is the cause of so great mischiefs and miseries, we have for testimony the voice of the prophets and of Christ himself. John 3 verse 43 I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him will ye receive. I omit the rehearsal of other examples, that one of the late most flourishing and happy kingdom of England I will touch in a word, not only because the example is exceeding lamentable, but because also there is none so very a child in all this auditory in whose time it chanced not. For of late years that kingdom and country of England, being endowed and beautified with the profession of the gospel in the happy reign of King Edward the Sixth, the churches and schools of learning being nobly founded, honourably enriched, and religiously ordered, the king himself, though about sixteen years of age, yet so far above the hope of his years, endued with such singular piety, admirable learning, and all princely virtues, that, in all that glorious kingdom, nothing might seem the more glorious than the king and governor himself, that kingdom of late years was inferior in perfect happiness to no nation of the earth. But go on the sudden through the untimely decease of that most noble Edward, a prince of so great hope, the popish tyrannical dominion re-entered this kingdom and took full possession thereof, wasting and spoiling with imprisonments, banishments, fire and sword, the most famous churches of that realm, taking some of the best renowned for learning and integrity of life, without all respect either of age, sex, or dignity, and torturing them with fiery flames, and other punishments of like barbarous cruelty, and scattering and dispersing others towards all parts and corners of the earth. It is now the fifth year since this scourge and these calamities have lain heavy on this land and oppressed the same. I rather acknowledge and bewail our own offences than take on me to censure the defaults of others, albeit the report of English exiles is yet, here there is a lacuna in the text, in mine ears, wherein they much complained of and bewailed the ingratitude, security, and loathing of the gospel which had overrun their whole country. And do we then seem to regard our good estate we enjoy more than they? I would we did, when Pilate had mingled the blood of the Galileans which he slew with the sacrifices, unless ye repent, saith Christ, ye all shall perish. The tumults and downfalls of empires and kingdoms wherewith the church is shaken are open conversant before our eyes, and threaten and menace us some bitter scourge. The Turkish cut-throats gape on us ready to devour us, striving by... Here there is a lacuna in the text, force to take Christ from among us, and here there is a lacuna in the text, Christ in our churches, of whom report goeth that they daily withdrawing Christian youth under their blasphemous foul paganism, and shedding, and here there is a lacuna in the text, and kinsfolk threaten and attempt farther eruptions and invasions on our borders, that execrable stink of the court of Rome curseth and banneth us, crying out away with us, that we may be rooted out from of the earth, heresies daily bud and blossom both within and without the church, and the errors and corruptions of truth crept into the church are beyond all number. And verily now is that time when, unless the Lord reserve a, here there is a lacuna in the text, unto us naught remaineth but that we should become as Sodom and Gomorrah. O oh, then let us not be so iron-hearted, let us not be so bitter enemies of our own souls, that we regard not these God's merciful visitations and threatenings of more sharper judgments to ensue. O oh, let us seek the Lord while he may be found. Let every one take care of his own salvation, and bear in mind whatsoever things concern the same, so that if the frame of nature should on a sudden be dissolved, we may be ready cheerfully to meet the Lord in the air, this coming in glory. These things which I have hitherto spoken concern all in general, but more particularly us that profess the studies of learning, for it is the common consent of all that ever either founded or governed schools, or ever were conversant in them, or would that others should frequent them, that they who are here brought up should become not only more learned but better mannered also than other men. Which truth being so evident, they describe a school to be a company appointed by God, of such as teach and learn sciences, meet and necessary for mankind, both touching God and other good things, that the knowledge of God amongst men be not clean abolished, that the church be continued and preserved, that many may be made heirs of life eternal, that discipline be maintained, and that men may enjoy other honest commodities issuing out of the arts.
We therefore shoot wide and miss much of the mark we aim at, unless we hold it for certain and true that our earnest and diligent endeavour in these schools, and here there is a lacuna in the text, of Christ and Christianity must be employed not so much for this end that we may be the more fraught with human and divine learning, but rather that being beautified and adorned with all laudable behaviour towards men and holiness to the Lord may be found acceptable in the sight of God and men. And it is a truth apparent in the Church that all the exhortations unto civil virtues without the doctrine of piety is naught else but an astraying and swerving from God, true godliness, perfect justice, and assured salvation. For the Holy Ghost hath pronounced this sentence, that whatsoever we do not with intent thereby to glorify God, whatsoever we do not in the name of Christ, whatsoever is not of faith, it is all, even altogether, sin. Wherefore, where the doctrine of the Church, secluded from our schools, we should not only not be able to teach or learn anything that belong to true and entire virtue, such as God requireth of us, but that small portion and remainder we have should make us of evil men worse and more impious, and that indeed not by the increase thereof so much as by the decrease and defect of those spiritual and supernatural qualities, without which nothing is holy, nothing wholesome unto us. And here, although the consent of men, wise and judicious, may satisfy us, yet let God's precepts prevail more with us which command us, research the Scriptures, to give attendance to reading, to divide the word aright, etc. Now, whereas no man can without school learning and exercise either himself perceive and discern aright, or expound and impart unto others in any good order and perspicuity, who is so purblind that he seeth not the near affinity wherewith the study of religion and piety is linked with school learning, let us therefore esteem that to be the exercise of greatest weight and moment in schools, which is a work of greatest importance in the church, and without long and continual school exercise cannot be performed by us, I mean the understanding and expounding of the writings of the prophets and apostles, and whereas we have opportunity offered us of searching out and sitting the truth of doctrine in greater measure than other countries and people, of a truth if we fail to use the same, we give the world occasion to suspect our cold zeal in religion, and our punishments for this, our negligence and ignorance, shall be the greater, for God hath given unto scholars especially the charge and care of preserving and advancing this his truth, not for our own sakes only, but for the good of others also. For other men with good reason expect instruction in the Scriptures, and the interpretation of the word at their mouths, who, for their learning, are able to understand diverse tongues, and search the course of doctrine. Whereas then religion and Christianity is to be taught in schools, that children may well conceive it, catechism is especially necessary, for neither can this age learn anything except it be taught. Here there is a lacuna in the text. Brief. Neither can either the teachers or the learners handle the right and in good order the parts of any science, whereof both of them have not digested in mind some rude sum. Both these are the cause why so often in scriptures we read short briefs of religion repeated, as, Repent and believe the gospel. He which believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Fight a good fight, keep the faith and a good conscience, etc., and whereas it is said, Colossians 3, verse 16, Let the word of God dwell in you plenteously and in all wisdom, the apostle's meaning is that we must use explications and interpretations such as are suitable with the sentences and doctrine of the prophets and apostles. Neither is catechism any other than a summary declaration of such sentences of Scripture. Now, whereas this little examen we intend to propose unto you is such, and the author thereof, hath faithfully and with great dexterity comprised the chief grounds of Christianity in proper and plain terms, and it seemeth that it would be very beneficial that in other churches there should the like form of catechism be extant. Prepare yourselves to the speedy learning thereof, and suppose that these our simple writings are the swaddling clouds wherein Christ, as it were swathed, will be found of us. You see how many urgent causes they are which they commend unto you, which they earnestly exhort you to embrace, which I beseech you to carry in mind and memory as they have been set down unto you. The commandment of God, your own salvation, your duty which you owe to posterity, the good example of a reformed church, your manner of life, your age or years, your friends' desires and hopes, the imminent dangerous times, the rewards and punishments we are to look for at God's hands. But as our admonitions and exhortations are necessary, so without the secret motion and working of the Holy Spirit, we know they little avail. 
Let us therefore turn ourselves and look towards God, and give him hearty thanks for this his inestimable benefit, that it was his good pleasure to bring us into the world in this sunshine of the gospel, and let us beg and crave to be taught and governed by him. If you enjoyed this recording, please support our channel by subscribing, liking, and sharing our content. We would also be happy to receive any comments or feedback below.